Hello, this is Kevin Steinhauser, and tonight we're going to be talking some multiple choice timing test taking strategies for AP Lang. Now, there's been some changes to the AP Lang test compared to just last year. So, for the first time this year in 2019 2020, we'll be taking the updated version of the AP Language test. So, this is absolutely something that you want to know going forward um, what exactly to expect on the multiple choice portion of the exam. Multiple choice is worth 45% of your overall score. And also, what do you do about it? What, do you, what should you do based on the knowledge of these changes? So any, there's a lot of outdated resources that talk about the history of the exam, what last year's was like, what the last decade was like. Some of that stuff will be useful. Some of that stuff is no longer useful when you're talking about practical time-taking strategies. So with all that in mind, it's very important this year as you're studying and as you're thinking about test taking strategies for multiple choice you're talking about the new updated exam so we'll talk about that tonight and then we'll talk about just how to practice how to get better how to study what to actually do during the multiple choice round so before we get going one quick thing you'll see in the chat that we have a three-day free trial if you are not a 5 plus member there's no reason not to sign up for the free trial it's literally uh, three days free. So if you have any um, streams you've been wanting to attend, or if you have any replays that you haven't seen um, but want to, this is your chance to just sign up, see what it's like. And hey, if you want to stick around five will plus all year, it's pretty cheap. And if you're like, hey, three days was enough, great. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and shift over, excuse me, to reviewing some multiple choice. What to do, how to maximize your minutes on this test. Couple more quick high level things for just big picture AP language uh, and Fiveable. We are on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Follow us there to always be getting highlights, news, etc. from Fiveable. And now let's talk about AP language. We have some streams happening just in two days on September 26th. Brandon is a student streamer. He will be putting together a really solid presentation on out of all the news, out of all the noise in September, what do you need to remember going forward? So this is really practical and application heavy for AP language. You will need to have general knowledge of the world around you in order to be mo most successful on the AP Lang exam this May. So Brandon every month is going to say, hey, this is exactly what you need to know. These are the key items not to let go as you know, noise is coming, noise is going. We, we, we take in a lot of information. Brandon's going to cut through the noise and say, don't forget this about what happened this month. And then next week, we are very busy on the AP Lang stream team. Catherine is going to be launching off of our presentation tonight and what we talk about tonight and just take an entire hour to do a multiple choice practice application practice with you all. So that's a must um, view stream because it's going to be some great deliberate practice on applying what we talk about tonight. Now, a lot of uh, teachers across the country and across the world teach AP language slightly differently. So some teachers are, even though it's pretty early in the year, all in right now on rhetorical analysis. Justin is another streamer who, this will be his first stream this year, but he's going to do just a great job with us this year. He's going to be talking at a pretty deep dive level on reading with an analytical mind. What that means is any text that's in front of you, how can you make sure that you are reading the, it at a high level and at an AP language college level? This is especially relevant for rhetorical analysis. On October 1st, Ashley Johnston's a, a teacher streamer, and she will be going over synthesis. Now, there's so many teachers like me who don't cover synthesis this early in the year. Teachers like Ashley start with synthesis or do synthesis really early on. There's no right or wrong answer on how to start or where to start. But a lot of students um, in my class keep asking me throughout the months of September and October, what the heck is this synthesis thing? I keep seeing it like on the, on the AP language materials, but you haven't talk, talked to us about it. So if your teacher has covered synthesis, if your teacher is about to cover synthesis, or if your teacher's like me and is punting on synthesis, but you want to know what to expect, join Ashley um, on October 1st to say just a general, what is synthesis? 
it'll be something that will be worth knowing for the year. And then Stephanie Kirk is another teacher streamer. She will be doing one more. So we have four presentations next week. This one is about taking control of your own academic growth. So with that, that means in multiple choice, in essay writing, how can you just take control? So many, so I, I taught, um, I streamed every Tuesday through Fiveable last year. And so many students would, would come on and say, hey, my teacher didn't cover that, or hey, my teacher, um, you know, just has a different approach. Great. So the, the value of having so many approaches to AP language is it, te it talks to students differently. So my approach in Colorado Springs might be different than my approach when I taught in Central Florida, and it might be different than if I taught in California. So my point is, depending on my students' needs are how I cover the course. But I can't hit every student's need every single day. It's just impossible, right? I have 30 students in an AP language class. It's impossible to have the best ideal lesson for each student every day. With all of that said, that's what Fiable is for, and that's what specifically Stephanie's stream is going to be about. If you feel like that wasn't your day, if you feel like your teacher was targeting someone else in class, what do you do about it? Hey, when you feel like your teacher was targeting you in class and you still want to grow more, what do you do, what do you do about it? So Stephanie's going to walk through some very practical things you can do to take full control of your learning. That's going to be a great stream coming up next week. So we are very busy here. Obviously, you might not be able to attend all of them, but as many as you can come to, the better, right? It's really great that Fiveable is here doing so many great streams in even September and moving into October because the more time you put up front, the more it's going to pay off all year. The standards that we're talking about do not change. So the standards I talk about tonight with multiple choice, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're going to start practicing those tonight, tomorrow, back in session, in class next week, etc. Because the more you deliberately practice, the better your strategies are going to be and the, and the more growing you'll have. So let's go ahead and start talking about multiple choice. So this is just about the 2020 exam. So we're coming up May of 2020. Here's what to expect. In the past, there's been more questions, but it's been an hour. This year, there will be 45 questions, and you'll have 60 minutes to complete them. This will be the first 60 minutes of the exam. Now, AP language is given in the morning, so you'll start taking the test between 8, 8.30 in the morning. You must be at your absolute A game at 8 o'clock, 8.15, whatever time your test starts, in the morning. You do not have time to wake up in the middle of your exam. The time will be moved on, and you will be sad. It's very important you come in just ready to go. So these very cliche things that you always hear teachers talking about, they are super relevant. Good night, sleep, full breakfast. You want a clear head. You don't want to be like, okay, I need a monster energy drink in between the multiple choice and the essay. You can't give up. The first hour is actually weighted heavier than the next two hours. And let me, let me break that down. In the first hour, you have 45% of your exam score figured out. Then you have a break, and then you have two hours and 15 minutes to write three essays. But that two hours and 15 minutes is 55% of your exam score. So just mathematically, which is the most important hour on the exam? It's the multiple choice. So the essays are important. They're worth more, but you have more time for them. You have to use every minute. We're going to talk very practically tonight about how to maximize your minutes, what exactly to do. Please make sure if there's any questions you have, let me know in the chat or in the ask a question. I know we have pretty light numbers tonight. Hopefully more people will be joining us and watching this replay. But please make sure you are absolutely leaving with every question you might have answered. Okay, so how this looks this year compared to in previous years. You will have five passages. They'll be relatively short, maybe about a page. And... This year, unlike any other year, you have two types of questions. So you'll see an abundance of practice questions for the reading style questions and historical uh, review books, etc. The writing questions, this is the first year that we have that. The only place with official AP writing questions is the AP classroom. So I'll make sure we talk about that by the end tonight. So my point is you'll, you'll be able to find a lot of reading practice you will not be able to find as much writing practice questions. 
So it's really important that the practice that you do come across, you practice very deliberately because a lot of students ask for an abundance of resources. I'm here to tell you there is an abundance of resources for the reading questions. There is not for the writing questions, but let's talk about what both are. So reading questions, slightly more than half of this exam, uh, the multiple choice portion, you'll have 23 to 25 questions. These reading questions will ask you to read and analyze nonfiction texts. Pretty straightforward, very similar to an SAT reading passage, with the exceptions that these are more rhetorical analysis mindset. So you're analyzing what is the author doing and how is it effective, or SAT language, I'm sorry, SAT reading questions might have like vocabulary questions on as part of it, but that, that's the type of text that you'll read. Now, I get a lot of these questions. How did the SAT and ACT fit into the big picture here? They are great resources. And most students who take AP language are juniors. There's some sophomores that take it, there's some seniors that take it, but the majority of us are juniors. So junior year is when you typically take the ACT and or SAT. So the more that you practice those things, the better for those things specifically, but also they will absolutely help prepare you for ACT. I'm sorry, for AP. But the official released AP questions that your teacher can give you and AP Classroom can provide are the best practice because you want to see the absolute rigor of the expectation on the AP language exam. SAT and ACT are college readiness tests. So to be successful there, you have to be at the college readiness level. AP language is slightly different. It's harder. AP language is a college level test. So it's going to be inherently more difficult than an ACT or an SAT. The skills are often the same. There's certainly a lot of overlap in the skills. But the student who might feel pretty successful on the SAT will not feel as successful on AP language. That's good to know, don't stress. Now, I don't know how it's gonna break down this year. Unfortunately, I can't tell you the numbers. I can tell you about last year though. Last year you had to get, I forget the exact number, but between 55 and 60% right on the multiple choice test to get a three on the exam. So as long as you're hitting about 55, 60%, you were good to go in terms of that college level credit. Now, most colleges take a three, some only take a four, and it, actually some only take a five. But most colleges take a three, four, or five to get you at least English 101 credit. So that's what I'm referring to. So three is a legitimate goal for every single person here. And this is fiveable, so we're talking about strategies to get to that four and ultimately that five level. If you're here every week between now and May 10th, a five is certainly doable for you. So we take what we do on these streams, we deliberately practice them. Okay, that's the reading questions. Now let's talk about the writing questions. These are new. They are asking you to read like a writer and consider revisions to, when they say stimulus text, they just mean a nonfiction passage that's not set in stone. So these are most similar to SAT writing and language questions. That's when you're given a passage and you're, you're like thinking like an editor. You are changing the passage to make it coherent, grammatically correct, and just stronger writing. AP language, it's going to be more, less like little verb tense, little grammar questions, more bigger picture structural questions. So we don't have a lot of practice questions yet. There are some in AP Classroom. These 20 to 22 questions are asking you to think like a writer and revise and make changes to the text. Now let's start to talk with some practical stuff. Everything I get tonight comes from these two uh, links. So you can access the slides. You can click on these links here. So one is taking me to AP College Board Central to get the official course exam description. And then the second one is looking at just some extra information about AP language. I just cited these here so you know this is where I'm pulling it from. And I've pulled the most important information for our purposes on the next couple slides. So I'm not going to go over these quickly for the sake of time tonight. But again, you can go back and access the slides. Here are the major skills that we need to work on this year, and then their weight on the exam. What I want to focus on is every column that says reading. So let's look at the reading ones. Rhetorical situation, reading. 
the description is to explain how writer's choices reflect the components of the rhetorical situation. You will have to do that. That's 11 to 14% of what this exam consists of. Now, the next one where it says reading is claims and evidence. You are identifying and describing the claims and evidence of an argument. So you're, you're reading at a high level in order to do that. You're not just summarizing. You're looking at how an author is crafting his or her argument. 13 to 16% of your multiple choice questions will be pulled from those. The next one is reasoning and organization. Reasoning is logic. So you're describing the reasoning, organization, and development of an argument. You'll see that's 13 to 16% as well. And then the last one is style. Explain how writers' stylistic choices contribute to the purpose of an argument. And ultimately, everything you do in this course and in your class should be these things. In a nutshell, what every one of these skills is asking is this. How is the writing achieving its purpose? How is the writing achieving its purpose? These are just little like breakdowns of you analyzing that question. Now let's talk very practically about time. I'm going to provide to you a recommendation. And this is merely my recommendation. This is what my plan A would be going into the exam. Now what I certainly hope you can do is practice, practice, practice this year. Practice with full length passages and ultimately, and you'll have to have your teacher help you with this, but practice with a full length exam or two. Why you need your teacher to help with this is because you're not gonna be able to find a lot of writing questions just because of what I addressed earlier. So with that in mind, you want your teacher you want to advocate to your teacher and they might say, yeah, we'll get there. And that's a totally valid answer because it's September. But you want to advocate for at least one or two full length practice runs for the main sake of timing. Timing matters so much. And that's what the point of this stream is, right? Timing and test taking strategies. Here's my plan A. This is what I would shoot for. But then I would learn from it. So if, if I take a full length and I have a plan A, but... I don't have, like something went wrong, I didn't have a great performance, I'm gonna make tweaks and adjustments. This is my plan A. You don't have to use my plan A, but have a plan A. Let's talk through this. The first two sets are longer. They will have 11 to 14 questions associated with them. Therefore, you should dedicate more time to them than, old, than you know, shorter passages. So I have, sorry, there's a typo. I have 60 minutes, let me fix that. There's um, 45 questions. Let's go back and make sure. 45 questions in one hour. So that's where I, that typo came from. So I have 60 minutes to answer 45 questions. I'm going to recommend taking 17 minutes for passage one. That's a reading passage. 17 minutes for passage two. That's another reading passage. The writing passages need to go a little bit quicker. A, because they're shorter. B, because you can answer the questions quicker. You won't have to go back and forth as much to the text and the, the question itself. And C, because there's just less questions on them. So you see, passage three will have seven to nine questions associated with it. Take 10 minutes on that. Passage four will have seven to nine questions associated with it. Take 10 minutes there. Set five, the final set will be shorter. There will only be four to six questions. Knock that out in six minutes and move on. Now, you don't want to get sucked up in a passage or into a question. So you have, in order for this plan to work, you have to only take 17 minutes on reading set one. Now, again, I am highly encouraging you to own your own plan. So what I want you to do is practice, practice, practice. Start somewhere. This is a good starting point. This is where I'll have my students start when we do timed practice. But feel free to make improvements to you personally along the way. Some of you will have more time with the reading. Some of you will need more time with the writing. That's totally fine. In fact, that's preferable for you to know your plan. All right, most of tonight I'm gonna to spend on the reading questions. Here's why. Timing, just historically, is harder on the reading questions than the writing questions. Why I say historically is I'm thinking back to the SAT. Every year, my students take the SAT in Colorado. That's our state test as well as a college readiness test. 
we take the PSAT 10, we take the PSAT 9. So this is very much a part of our lives. On the reading test, students really struggle to finish, and that's by design. On the writing and language test, they don't struggle to finish as hard. They, in fact, they often finish with a few minutes to spare. So I'm taking my knowledge there and applying it here. I'm dedicating more time to practice sets one and two because those are the readings, and less time on the writing sets. Okay, with all that said, let's talk about reading tonight. Because again, that's where you'll be able to have most of your practice time because that's where most of the AP language re resources are from multiple choice. So again, you'll have two nonfiction reading passages. You'll have 23 to 25 questions. You'll have what I'm recommending is slightly more than half of your overall multiple choice time, 34 minutes. That breaks down to 17 minutes of passage. What to do with that time? So the first thing I want you to do is consider starting with the easier of the two texts. So the inherent question is, how do I know which one's easier? Well, you're not going to fully know until you start reading them. But here's what I would do. Flip through, look at the first two passages, guess which one is harder based on the following criteria. The year of publication and the organization of the text. The trend is this, right? If the year is older, the text is harder. If you get a passage from 1850, that is probably going to be more difficult than a text from 1990. If you get a text from 1750, it's probably going to be harder than the text from 1850. That's not always true, but it's often true. The second criteria, and you'll see this is so relevant in AP Lang, the organization of the text. The longer the paragraphs, the more difficult the text probably is going to be. What I mean by that, and you will see in AP Language, you might have a text that is 80 lines long. That is one paragraph. That's more difficult than a text that's 90 lines long, but it's split up into four paragraphs. Here's why. Paragraphs are our friends. I love paragraph indents. Here's why. Paragraphs are the author's way of indicating to us as readers that they are slightly shifting topic or tone. If I just see a big chunk of text, I don't know if they're shift, like I have to identify the shift. They have not sing signaled it to me that way. So what I really wanna focus on is some of you are going to be able to be like, hey, I'm just gonna go in order number one to number 45 and be just fine. Some of you are gonna be more strategic than that. Know what your plan is and execute your plan and make adjustments to your plan as we go, as you practice this year. The reason why it's so valuable to start, you want to build with the easier text, you want to build momentum, you want to build confidence as you go, and also you want um, to make sure you get to see every question. You don't want to get sucked into a passage, and when you're like, crap, where do I begin? Because you're starting with the hardest passage, and it's going to be difficult. You, it's very tempting to be like, well, I, I, I'm going to make up the time, but I've, I've got to like answer some questions here. It's very easy, and this happens all the time, and I don't want it to happen to you. Students get stuck on the first passage. They look up at the clock, and they're like, shoot, I should be done with passage two by now. It's been almost half an hour, and I'm still answering question 12. Don't let that happen to you. So start, build momentum, keep an eye on the clock, and go. Now, I want you to think, feel free, we've got some people here tonight to type this out in the chat, but everyone think about this. Do you think you should read the question stems before or after you read the passage? If you're with me tonight, go ahead and jot in the chat, what do you normally do? Do you, on the SAT, on the ACT, on any AP practice that you've had, do you skip right over the question and read the question stem? Or do you read the passage and then look at the questions? Take a second to think about what you normally do. And let's talk through this. OK, so I used to teach my students to read the questions first. And I would tell them because it guides their reading. I don't tell my students that anymore. Here's why. I have noticed, especially in AP language, if you don't have a full, strong understanding of the text, the questions are going to be a struggle. 
I see some activity on the chat. So yeah, keep keep talking through this. Here's my recommendation. And again, you can be like, I appreciate the recommendation. I'm going to do it my way. That's totally fine because what I appreciate about that is that you're thinking about what your way is and you have a reason for it and it's proven and tested. What I can't have you do is say, it's my way and I'm never going to try anything else. Always be willing to just take a moment to try a new way and hey, if it didn't work for you, at least now you know it's not your way. Here's my recommendation. Don't even look at the questions until you understand the passage. Now the caveat there is you've got to read the passage quickly and understand it. But take seven or eight minutes to read, to annotate, to figure out what the heck this text is saying. Once you can do that, the questions are going to fall in line in large part. So what I don't want is to take too long on the questions because here's what often happens. Okay, question one is about blank topic. Therefore, I need to go look for a blank topic in the text. That's not what I want you to do at all. I want you to look at the text holistically and understand. And then I want you to like just flip back and forth during the questions. So we're going to talk like some strategies here, but the number one strategy I'm recommending is read to read. Don't read to answer questions. The way you can make sure you're doing that is ignore the questions while you're reading. Now you got to go at a brisk pace because you know the questions are coming, but take the time to understand the passage. Once you do, I think you'll actually be more successful in the questions. So Nicole, you said, uh, so taking the time to understand the passage won't be against your favor because of the lack of time. That's a great question. That's exactly kind of where I'm pushing you tonight. So let's talk very practically moving forward off of that. And, and now we've got some activity here. So again, if you have questions, thoughts, please be active in the chat or ask a question if it's something you want to make sure I definitely flag and see. Let's be practical here on what that reading first questions later has in terms of an implication for the test. I've got to annotate. Now, some of you have seen me on previous live streams. Some of you might not have seen when I talked about annotations. Let's take a moment to do that. When I, every year, I'm a big believer in annotations, and my students find that out on day one or week one. When I say annotations, half of my students get so excited. They're like, this is my favorite part of English class. Can I just go to my lock and get my three color highlighter so I can like color code my annotations? And the other half look at me like, oh no, not this guy. Annotations, this is what he's about. They think annotations are like the dumbest, worst thing I could ask them to do. I'm a big believer in annotations, but I'm not a big believer in color coding annotations. I'm a big believer in annotating quickly, efficiently, and effectively. Because we're actually going to use annotations to maximize our time. One, annotations keep you engaged. If you read the passage in four minutes, but you can't tell me what you just read, that's not a good use of your four minutes. So you'll take seven or eight minutes to read, to annotate, and that's actually a good use of your time. Because if you know what to annotate, you understand what's happening in the passage, at least to a certain extent. These passages are tough. These passages are often boring. Annotations keep you engaged. If you have 60 minutes, you do not have time to start having a head nod like, oh man, this is boring and losing focus. If you get to the end of a paragraph or the end of a sentence and can annotate, you're engaged. You have to be engaged for all 60 minutes here. And then annotations actually will save you time. A, because it's going to keep you moving at a fast pace. And B, because during the multiple choice round, we're going to practice one question tonight. During the multiple choice round, you are going to go back and forth to your annotations. You don't have time to read these texts twice. You barely have time to read them once. So your annotations are quick notes to yourself about what this text is about so you can anchor yourself in the text. I'll show you exactly what I'm looking at for annotations here in a moment. Now, a frequently asked question is this. Dude, I don't have time to annotate. Like, you're asking me to do something that I literally don't have time for. Here's my answer to that. You don't have time to color code your annotations. You don't have time to write me a paragraph in the margin. You're writing quick little bullet point notes to yourself. What, you, what my students usually mean by that is I don't have time to annotate because I don't know what to annotate because I don't understand the passage. And I have news for you. You have to understand the passage. Okay, easier said than done. I get that. But you have to give yourself credit. 
you are going to have to pause and reread. Like if, if there's a sentence you're like, I have no clue what the heck to write, reread it. You have to, right? You have to make meaning from these words. And then you're going to write down what you understand in the margin. Let me show you what that looks like here in a couple minutes. But again, when you say I don't have time for annotations, what you actually might be meaning is I don't understand the text. Hey, that's kind of the core of this class, right? This is how I want you to annotate. Now you can modify this, you can make adjustments, but again, be strategic to yourself. So number one, underline key phrases that will anchor you in the text. I promise you, even if you're the best reader in your high school, there will be a sentence or two on the AP Lang exam, minimum, that you don't understand. Anchor phrases are phrases you do understand that are, you're going to like make meaning surrounding branching out from. Second, it's your job to identify the chunks of text. Remember, not most of these passages will not have short little paragraphs. They'll have bigger paragraphs that have shifts within them. You're going to bracket them, and you're going to just give yourself a note on what that chunk was about. You don't have time to read it twice, so you're going to read your note next time when you go back to it. And you're going to clarify vague pronouns. If you come across it, circle it, find what it is referring to. Draw a line back to the antecedent is what, is what that is called. If you find his, but it's not clear at first read who he is, pause and figure it out. Circle his. Draw a line back to the guy who they're referring to. The reason I do that is twofold. A, I have to make sure I'm understanding as I'm reading. And B, I'm going to go back often during the questions very quickly and read um, you know, some of these sentences again. I don't want to be like, oh, shoot, who was that guy? I'm just going to like give myself that favor. Now, we're going to practice. We're going to read a couple slides, and I'm going to show you my annotations. This is a, an actual AP passage. Bear with me here. Read with me. What I want to do is read it and show you this is exactly what the sweet spot of annotations are. Think of the Goldilocks rule. I don't want too much annotations because if I, if I underline every sentence, I'm basically underlining nothing, right? Like, I, I want sentences that are going to pop off to me, the most important ones. But I also don't want too few annotations because, again, annotations are valuable. So here's the sweet spot, the, the Goldilocks of annotations, the, the just enough but not too much amount. All right, so let's read. I have three slides here that we'll break down. This is not the whole passage. This is just to make the point of this is how I would annotate. I think we're spending a lot more time on the reading style questions tonight than the writing because, A, that's where a lot of your practice will come from. B, and A, that's because of the resources, right? B, that's where the majority of questions are, like slightly more than half. And C, that's where you'll need these time strategies the most. Okay, so the following essay by a British writer was first published in 1900. Let's read. We may talk about our troubles to those persons who can give us direct help. But even in this case, we ought as much as possible to come to a provisional conclusion before consultation, to be perfectly clear to ourselves within our own limits. What I just read was one sentence. These sentences are often going to be super long. I have to, as the reader, be able to cut to the chase and say this is the most important phrase or clause in this sentence. So let's look at that again. We ought as much as possible to come to a provisional conclusion before consultation. Let's keep reading. Some people have a foolish trick of applying for aid before they have done anything whatever to aid themselves, and in fact, try to talk themselves into perspicuity. The only way in which they can think is by talking, and their speech consequently is not the expression of opinion already and carefully formed, but the manufacture of it. So that last phrase I underlined because those are the two most important phrases so far. As a reader, it's just my job to identify those most important phrases. And then here's quick annotations. You might even do it even quicker. I'm writing this down in like five seconds or less per bullet point. I'm writing quick, sloppy, as long as I understand my thoughts here. He's saying we need to think for ourselves, and people often talk their way into an opinion. Boom. I'm just summarizing his point, so I don't have to reread his words. I can reread mine. Let's keep going. I underline the topic sentence here. We may also tell our troubles to those who are suffering if we can lessen their own, their own troubles. It may be very great relief to them 
to know that others have passed through trials equal to theirs and have survived. There are obscure nervous diseases, hypochondriatic fancies, almost uncontrollable impulses, which terrify by their apparent singularity. And then I underlined the last sentence here. That's not a hard and fast rule. That's just how this little paragraph worked. Uh, that the most important sentences were the first and the last. If we could believe that they are common, these diseases, the worst of the fear would vanish. So these are when we should tell people of our suffering. So let's read my annotation. I put this in my own words very quickly. You might even be more concise. Talking about suffering can help people not feel alone. That's what's happening so far in this paragraph. Now, there's a but. Buts are great words. Ands are great words because it's a clue that the author is giving us. So here, this but's saying, okay, now I'm going to talk about something else. I just said, hey, it, sometimes it's valuable to tell people about our problems. As a reader, I'm thinking the next paragraph is not going to tell me to talk about our problems. Let's go ahead and read it. But as a rule, we should be very careful for our own sake not to speak much about what distresses us. I underline that. Not even the whole sentence, just the core of it. Expression is apt to carry with it exaggeration. And this exaggerated form becomes henceforth that under which we represent our miseries to ourselves so that they are thereby increased. By reserve, on the other hand, they are diminished for we attach less importance to that which is not worth while to mention. Secrecy, in fact, may be our salvation. Now, I want you to notice what I did in the last sentence there. Uh, this is a great rule to apply to a simple sentence here, but also you'll apply it to these more convoluted, difficult sentences. If there's like a little phrase in the middle, I'm not underlining that because I'm only underlining the core of the sentence. Secrecy may be our salvation. Here's my annotation. And if I'm being completely honest, I typed up more on this slide than I would have written just for clarity. But if I'm writing, I'm like bullet pointing, bullet pointing, bullet pointing. I wrote, talking about our problems can lead to exaggeration, which makes the problems seem worse than they are. I have one more slide, actually. Uh, let's just read this really quickly. And then we'll talk about what to do with the questions. It is injurious to always be treated as if something were the matter with us underlined it, topic sentence, it's very clear. It is health giving to be dealt with as if we were healthy. And the man who imagines his wits are failing becomes stronger and sounder by being entrusted with a difficult problem than by all the assurances of a doctor. Okay, my annotation says, it's not always good to act like something's wrong. Just putting, quickly paraphrasing the point of that chunk of text. Okay, so I would do that for the whole time, and I've got to be going quickly. The annotations, writing them take 5, 10 seconds each. It's the thinking about what to write, which takes time. But again, that's the whole point of reading. Now, let's talk about time per passage. I have 17 minutes that I'm recommending. You, you at least start there, see if you can do it, see if you need an extra minute, see if you can shave off a minute. But that's my recommendation. 17 minutes per reading passage. Approximately half of your time should be spent reading annotating. So if I have 17 minutes, I've got eight, eight and a half minutes to be doing that. The other half should be spent answering questions. And if I have, let's say 12 questions, 13, 14 questions, I've got to go quick. I've got like 30, 40 seconds a question. So I can't get sucked into a question. I've got to feel like I'm going at lightning speed. I don't have time for brain breaks. But that's that kind of the balance here. Half the time to read, half the time to answer questions. If you invest eight minutes or so to read, these questions will go better for you. So don't rush the reading. If anything, rush the answering the questions. Okay. Some advice for you. First step you do, once you read the passage, you take about those eight minutes to do so, you read and annotate. Go read the questions. Just go in order because they will often go in order of the text itself. But have a holistic understanding of the text before you go to question one, even if question one's on the first line of the text. So you're gonna answer the questions in order. You're gonna flip back to your annotations for every question that references the text explicitly. There's gonna be some questions that say, overall, the passage blank. For example, the purpose of the passage is blank. 
you should have that so strong in your head. You should be thinking about those overall questions before you even flip to question one. So you're going to take as quick as you can, use process of elimination to answer that question. So for these questions that say in line 15 or in paragraph one, you're going to quickly go back to your annotations. You're going to review that line or lines. When you don't know, this is step two, the answer. Or when determining the best answer will take too long, again, you have like 30 or 40 seconds per question, take your best guess, use process of elimination, and move on. Three more things. I was so, I'm talking about process of elimination. I'd rather have you say, I know it's not A, I know it's not C. I think maybe it's B, move on, than just blindly guess B, right? So you put some method to your guessing madness if you have to guess or when you have to guess. All right. When you're up against the clock, so when it's been 17 minutes, go quicker through the questions. Guess on them, like start guessing quicker, because I want you to get to all the writing and language questions. So I, I recommend taking the reading test first, the writing and language test second, just because I want, like, it just feels natural that way. That's the way the test will be set up. You might change, you might say, hey, I'm going to take the writing and language test first and then reading second. As long as you have a solid plan, that's great. But either way, you're up against the clock. So I'd rather have you guess on the final two reading questions per that passage than on all of a writing and language passage, right? We just got to like use our time to the best of our ability here. Every time you guess throughout the entire exam, if it's a blind guess I'm talking, use the same letter. It's just proven statistically you'll be more likely to hit one or two of those guesses. If you just, they call it Christmas treeing it, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E you might totally just miss on all of them. Let's do a practice question. I'll read the question. Think about what the answer is. And if you're in the chat still, throw the question on there, or throw what you think is the answer on there. The author implies that the speech of some people in line five is likely to be. Here's my process. Go back to line five, look at your annotations, get your answer in mind, and then match your answer quickly to A, B, C, D, or E. So let's do that. The author implies that the speech of some people is, let's find some people. It's the second full sentence. Some people have a foolish trick of applying for aid before they have done anything, whatever, to aid themselves. So I'm just looking at that. I found it. Look at my annotations. We need to think for ourselves. People often talk their way into an opinion. That's what's happening here. So I think, let's go back to the question. The author implies that the speech of some people, what, what's my answer? Some people have a foolish trick of applying for aid before they have done anything, whatever, to aid themselves. If you're in the chat, what do you think the answer is? So think about it and then use your brain to match your answer to college boards. Let's take 30 seconds to just use process of elimination. What do you think the answer is? All right, Nicole, you think it's C. The answer is C. Nice job. Ill-considered and impetuous. I have good news and I have bad news. There's going to be questions like this where you know one of the words, but you don't know the second. That's why process of elimination is so important. You might say, okay, I think it's in, um, excuse me, ill-considered and go for it. So that, that's really the process here. We're going to take a few minutes to talk about writing and language questions. Anyone who has a question on either the reading or the writing, please let me know. But this is how we'll end here tonight. Um, oh, you only recognize the second word. Hey, either way, um, that, that's exactly what's going to happen on the exam. So use your knowledge, and that's why process of elimination is key. All right, so any questions you have about this whole process, I can ask them before you leave. I hope this is useful. I hope this is something that you can start applying these time strategies as soon as you have that next practice round. <coughs> okay, so writing, writing questions are new this year. And again, you won't have, honestly, a lot of practice like opportunities. So you really want to maximize those. 
There will be two passages with seven to nine questions, one passage with four to six questions, for a total of 20 to 22 questions. I suggest you take 26 minutes. You took 34 on the reading, you'll take 26 on the writing. There's less questions on the writing, and I think you can do these quicker. Okay, some very high level. We're not, I don't have deliberate practice here tonight for this, but I do have some strategies and some suggestions. Read every word of the passage. It's so um, like detrimental to like, here's question one, here's the sentence question one's about, and just jump to that sentence. You have to read to read. Now, the difference between writing and reading is with reading, I want you to read the entire passage and then answer the questions. With writing, I want you to read from top to bottom until you get to a question. And then pause, this is step two, and answer the question as you come across it. Because that's just the way it's going to be flowing for most questions. Now, there's going to be some questions that are more big picture. That's what I'm saying in step three. For organization questions, these are the questions that require you to consider the placement of a sentence or a paragraph. In other words, sentence three would be better served where? Well, you can't answer that until you've read the entire paragraph. So, just, so like, read the question, have that thought in mind, and then finish the paragraph and then go back and answer the question. So you have to read the surrounding text that the question's addressing before answering it. But when you can, pause, answer the question, move on. These are tough because you're going to get flawed writing, and it's your job to make it better. So if uh, just know, as you're reading, this is not a perfect text. That's why this is going to be difficult. But the more practice you have, the better. So where can you practice? My strong recommendation, there's a plethora of SAT writing and language questions. If you go to College Board's website, a quick Google search, you'll be able to find, I believe, eight full-length SAT practice tests. Every full-length practice test has four passages with 11 questions each of this style of question. Now, it's not going to be a perfect overlap, but it's the same concept. So that is a place with a plethora of resources. They're not perfect, but they're certainly working on the same skills. College Board is the parent company of the SAT and AP. So there's a lot of overlap here. And the most important place is AP Classroom. Now, your teacher will have to assign this. And they might not say, you have free access to every question, because they might give you assessments throughout the year to check your understanding. With that in mind, advocate and say, hey, I want to make sure that by the end of the year, we are seeing every single possible writing question because there's not that many. And I want to see as many as I can. So just keep that in mind. Those are literally the two places at this point where I'm recommending that you go practice these skills. I don't have a practice question tonight in part because I want your teachers to be able to save the AP Classroom practices for when it's best appropriate in your scope and sequence. So first, big picture takeaway. Determine the order that you will tackle the passages. Some of you might want to start with reading and then go to writing. Some of you might want to flip that. Either way is okay. I want to recommend my students do reading first. But honestly, there's no right or wrong answer here. Same with reading. Start reading. Uh, start with the easiest, if that works for you. Some of you might prefer to go question 1 to question 45 on this exam. Hone your ideal timing scenario. I gave you my timing scenario. In fact, I'm going to scroll back up to that quickly. Here we go. Passage one is a reading passage, 17 minutes. Passage two is a reading passage, 17 minutes. Passage three, writing, 10 minutes. Passage four, writing, 10 minutes. Passage five, shorter writing, 6 minutes. That's my suggestion, but it's important that you have your plan in place. Maybe this is plan A, and you start to like hone your ideal scenario based on that deliberate practice round. It's important that you know what's best for you, and it's important that you've practiced and te tested your scenario and made adjustments accordingly. Okay, how long do you consider... 
that we should invest every day to practice? Great question. It really does depend. So like, I don't want to give like this answer that's not relevant to everybody. If you are in four AP classes, you don't need to practice this every single day. In fact, you're going to run out of resources if you do. Here's what I recommend. Car Instead of like talking daily, let's talk weekly. I would recommend, so you let's say you have an hour of AP language every day. Now I'm well aware every school is different. My school, our classes are 57 minutes. The school I used to teach at, our classes were only 49 minutes. I have a lot of uh, teachers that I know who are on block schedule, which means they meet you know, two or three times a week. There's some teachers who are doing this on a semester basis. So with all that to say, let's assume you're working really hard in class for five hours a week. Let's assume you're working really hard in class for another three hours of homework. That's eight hours. What I would say is it's still September. I think the sweet spot is 10 to 12 hours of deliberate practice a week. Now let's be clear. If you're absent, you're missing that hour of practice. If you're in class but you're like not with it that day, you miss that hour of practice. And what I'm saying is practice for multiple choice and writing. So in general, I'd say shoot for 12 practice hours for AP language every week. That's five, 10 to 12 hours. That's five hours of class time on average. Most students have that. That's three hours of homework. Do that well, don't go through the motions. That means you really have to have like two to four more hours of practice. Fiveable is a great resource. AP Classroom is a great resource. If you're looking for stuff beyond that, pick up a resource um, that there's so many, if you just type in AP Language Study Guide, there's so many third party, not college board, huge books with a ton of practice sets in there. I would say do one a week, maybe do two a week. Where you This is the strategy that I recommend here. Time yourself the 17 minutes for a reading passage. Look at the answers and take unlimited time then to review the answers. Don't move on to the second practice problem or practice uh, passage until you literally do understand every question on that first practice set. Less is more here, actually. I have students who just want to keep practicing, practicing, practicing by just like taking time, time to practice. But that, while valuable, is not the best way to study. The best way to study is to time yourself with the practice, learn from it, and make sure you understand every question and understand the passage better. So you're timing yourself, and then you're seeing how you did without a time scenario to really hone in your practice. That's a really good question. That's exactly where uh, we were headed, actually. So to wrap up tonight, let's, let's end with some final thoughts. Where do I start? Your teacher might be giving you a ton of time to practice. It's early in the year, so maybe not yet. It's totally okay to ask your teacher, how much time practice do you think we'll have in the month of October? And hey, there's no right or wrong answer here. So it's not like, oh, my teacher isn't doing this. It's just advocate for yourself, which means if you're not going to get it in the classroom, get it outside of the classroom. Buy a book. If your teacher's like, hey, I'm saving AP classroom, practice a passage for 15, I'm sorry, 17 minutes, and then do what we just talked about. So you're focusing on speed and comprehension on that multiple choice round, but also you're in other classes, you're reading outside of AP language. Every time you read, read for speed and read for comprehension. That's actually going to translate directly to your AP language time. And then start reading like a writer. Just like start building those skills, even if it's not the practical way uh, that the questions are going to look. The best thing to do here is actually peer review your, your and other students' writing. The more you're peer reviewing, the more you're reading like a writer. So swap essays with a peer. Obviously, get your like teacher's permission to do this and say, or, or maybe like wait till it's graded, and then obviously, you don't need permission. I'm just saying get permission if like you're not allowed to, to collaborate on assignment. You want to make sure you know that. But swap essays with a peer and tell your peer, give your peer feedback. This sentence would be better served here. You're missing a concluding sentence. Here's what you could say. The more that you're just thinking critically through reading, the better you're going to be. Now let's do two final thoughts here. 
do you first let's talk about um just like big picture do you generally breathe too fast or too slow on time to assessments go ahead and throw that into the chat and i'm just gonna let you think for a second what is your trend do you generally read too fast too slow or is that not usually a problem The reason I say too slow is because that's actually just as much of a problem as too fast. But the reason I say too fast is because that's actually just as much of a problem as too slow. Now you can read fast and effectively, but if you're reading so fast that you're not comprehending, that's a problem, right? So um, yeah, that's a common problem, to read too fast that you rush to the questions. And you'll actually find you'll get more questions right if you just slow down a couple minutes and just fully absorb and just be saying, I have one job to do in the first eight minutes, and that's to understand what the heck this author is saying. That's freeing, right? I have one job to do in eight minutes. Then I have 14 jobs to do in the next eight minutes. I have to really go quickly through these questions, and that's okay. So the questions should be going quicker for you, and the reading should be going a little bit slower if, the, if you're in that boat. Okay, well, let's end with one more question. What can you do? to improve your timing. Just think here for a second. What's the next practical step you can take? Maybe it's, I just need to start timing myself to see. Maybe it's, I, I need to try slowing down and see if that improves my score. Maybe that's, I need to annotate more so I can lean on those annotations during the question round. Maybe it's, I need to use process of elimination more. What's something that you can do to improve how you go about this test with timing. I promise you, AP language is a lot about skill, but it's, uh, guys, I, it is what it is. It's, it's also a lot about timing. So I promise you that these are things we're thinking about. I'm glad you're here tonight. I'm glad you were able to see this. And I'm hoping people watch this replay in the month of September and October because this, you're not gonna figure out your, like, your sweet ideal scenario until you've practiced and done some trial and error. So start with that. What can I do to improve? The next time you take a practice test, whether it's for yourself or in the classroom, try something new, see how it went, and adjust accordingly. Okay, that's our slides tonight. That's our presentation tonight. Um, again, this is all about deliberate practice and getting better every single time. You are not ready to take the test yet because it's only September. We have a long time away. And hey, I'm not saying you're not like skilled enough. I'm saying you have a lot of months left to grow. So where you might get a three today, you can get a four or five in May. It's by implementing and practicing these strategies. All right, so with all of that, I would like to say good luck. If there's feedback, let, let us know on Fiveable. Again, we have a lot of live streams happening next week. I would love for you guys to come participate, really learn from each other, and learn from our student teacher streamers. Everyone have a great rest of the week. And again, Brandon has a current event stream just in two days. That would be a great one if you only can go to one of the next couple. Um, that one is going to be super helpful. He'll be doing that every single month, but he won't overlap because he's looking at what happened in that month specifically. So it's a great way to kind of capstone the month. It's more of a fun way. It's not like, here's a very much like practical test taking strategies. He's just saying, hey, here's what you should know as a human being and as a test taker. All right, guys, have a great night and I will see you next time.